Ukraine. Sure. Um, yeah, just as a sort of warm up before I actually dive in. Uh, okay, what to expect? First of all, uh, another disappointment for you, maybe. I'm not really an expert on, on Eastern Europe uh, or um, generally on, on war situations, I, but I think we've got really enough expertise here in the room. I hope we can, my input's not too long, that we've got a lot of time for, for debate. So definitely feel free to, to fill up on anything um, if you think that is necessary, because I'm too sparsely on that. Um, generally, I'll be speaking uh, from our, our um, CP line on the issue, but um, as I always sort of say nicely in collective books, if any mistakes are done, they are absolutely mine, of course, and not that we have any thoughts in our line. Um, yeah, and as already said, I'll only quickly go into to the necessities. Um, then I think I'm going to elaborate a bit longer on, yeah, I'll elaborate a bit longer um, on how we stand to different forms of drawing lines and um, how the whole debate developed within the CP in the Netherlands uh, and why we now at this point have the tactical choices we have. And I hope uh, that is at least my expectation that at the end of this uh, debate, we have learned a bit more about the specific situation on the topic uh, from the Dutch left, not just the CP. Um, I'm not quite sure how well known the CP is here by everybody, so I'll just do a very quick recap um, what we actually are. Um, the same like the CPGB, the Marxist group, it was actually inspired a lot uh, from here. Uh, founded originally as a faction in 2014 within the SP, the uh, Socialist Party of the Netherlands, what is a sort of now broader left uh, um, yeah, very parliamentary focused um, party uh, with its origins actually in a in the Maoist sect. You see that bit in the cultural things, but from the politics, it's very much a sort of left social democratic, democrat, social democratic parliamentary party. Um, lots of the colleagues or uh, comrades were uh, being expelled from CP because of our lines um, from 2020 onwards, um, meaning that hardly any of the comrades are still members of SP. Um, yeah, and we do active interventions next to the debates into the workers' movement now, so that's diversified a bit. Uh, we've got the project, the Brazil Solistan, what I'll be uh, touching a few times, I guess it comes up in the debate a bit as well. Uh, VORT, what is a youth organization, a revolutionary-ish um, Marxist youth organization, what used to be the youth organization of the SP. Then in a smaller term, we still do interventions in the SP, uh, from within, but mainly from, from outside. And uh, yeah, the, the new side of our work, what's been um, growing in prominence last year is our, our trade unionist work. And um, to make it clear, we are a platform and we definitely argue that we are not a party and are not planning to form a party, but I think that is actually uh, a fight we have to do in the broader movement and within the working class itself. Okay, then, because, of course, the whole question of social imperialism at the moment is always bound up, of course, on the acute situation of Ukraine, um, just a very short recap of what our stance is there. I'm not going to say too much to it, because, of course, there is uh, a panel from Jack uh, on Friday over that uh, subject, and I think he can, with way more expertise, um, go into that, and the differences are not so big. Well, first of all, of course, we interpret in comparison to other left groups in the Netherlands, um, the war in Ukraine as an inter-imperialist war between two imperialist blocs. Um, definitely an important point for us is that that means you have to have a long-term analysis of all the actors involved and to not just reduce it to uh, the newest uh, uh, attack and what is happening in the east of Ukraine. Um, in the debate context is, of course, uh, important the question of how do you stand to sovereignty and self-determination of countries. As CP, we actually say that that is a very, is actually a marginal aspect uh, within that because we do not think uh, that the question of self-determination of countries or peoples is actually a fetish what stands over other analytical um, yeah, deliberations about that. 
Then, of course, an important point is, uh, as always, when you've got confrontations between Russia, China, or other bigger imperialists with the with NATO imperialist bloc, um, the danger of escalation. Uh, I think there it's important to point out that our analysis is a bit different from the CP. Uh, GB, not so much that we do not think there is a possibility of um, or danger of escalation, um, but we do actually, I think, interpret the dangers there a bit less um, than you guys do, but maybe you can fill up on that later. Uh, okay, now to the actual topic of necessity. Well, what do we see actually as the, the stakes for the left um, on taking different positions um, here? As just mentioned, uh, of course, there's always a, the, the question of if you participate in the public debate um, on a pro-NATO uh, stance uh, or a pro-weapon uh, delivery stance, something like that, you are, of course, supporting the war to a certain extent, uh, what has a danger of escalation. On the other hand, for us, that is actually a not so important power, uh, thing because you've got to put that into the range of power. And if you sort of look, I think it's not so different in uh, in Great Britain, yeah. Um, but within the Dutch context, of course, the, the radical left or the small left, how we sometimes call it, uh, at home, hasn't really got a, a, a big, powerful influence on the broader debate on that. Um, but of course, that is a theoretical uh, thing we have to keep in mind. Um, more important points um, is, of course, the moment you accept or through taking a pro-NATO stance uh, on the question of Ukraine or in other conflicts, you are de facto accepting the liberal Western narrative of how these conflicts are, are working. Well, it's as such not a nice thing to do, but as well has sort of two bigger, deeper uh, problems. Of course, if you start doing that by single context, you are actually endangering, in our view, the possibility to have an independent analysis of world history and world, um, yeah, modern doings of the world, I don't know if that's an English word, um, on the longer, longer, come on, the longer. Hmm? Yeah, in the longer term, yeah. So, um, yeah, and of course, uh, within this, uh, liberal Western uh, narrative, um, there's very strong focus um, on the nation and the national struggles and the framing of this being a sort of, um, well, nearly an anti-imperialist war sometimes, what is sort of then reflected within the, uh, the wording of the pro-war left uh, within the Netherlands. And there we sort of think that is actually a very dangerous line of argument because with that, you are doing the first step of fetishizing the social constructs of nation states and, and the thing. And of course, uh, what we see in the specific situation of this uh, debate within the, the, the Dutch social imperialist groups um, is as well that it's not just a fetishization, but of course you do not question the different forms the social constructs can be seen as in between uh, sort of the Ukraine and the Russians and actually ignoring um, deeper social um, yeah, deeper questions of national identity construction within the region. Um, a second point uh, I want to quickly delve into is the question of, of course, social imperialism in our uh, interpretation of the word is but one form, one specific form of opportunist politics altogether. And of course, so the thing is that if you start on opportunist politics in one section uh, of your analysis or, or your, your politics, um, that can be exported or is automatically exported to other areas because of course it's a certain mindset uh, between opportunist politics and uh, fundamental politics or uh, principiella politics, how we call it. Yeah. Uh, then from the more tactical uh, point of view, um, we definitely frame the whole question here of the pro-war support as actually de facto, because it is bound into the NATO thing, as a leftist support for NATO as such. We think you cannot actually distinguish between we have a pro-war and pro-supportive um, 
stance on the conflict, but at the same time has a, a real anti-NATO stance. We think they are actually contradictory because the war is bound in, even if it's not direct participation, but bound into the NATO system. That then, of course, uh, leads to, in our eyes, uh, loss of uh, class independence stance within the organization, because you automatically start binding yourself to the nation state and um, yeah, and its interest. Um, yeah, that we just see generally back again to the, the argument of uh, principle politics that that is a road to coalitionism. Um, and um, if we now sort of compare that to other situations, um, I would argue, and that's a bit out of my, my own personal expect, um, experience, uh, I was part of Die Linke in Germany, a sort of broad leftist uh, um, project, uh, I guess you've heard of it, um, for nearly 15 years, an active member. And you can see there as well that the argument of this is an exceptional situation of NATO support because of the alleged broader picture, de facto then quite often brings you, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an open door policy thing of that if I support it once, I can support it more often. And if you then look at the de facto um, power situation within organizations and groups on a broader basis, um, we always have a tendency of, of becoming bourgeoisie within the system, um, having the negative influences of parliamentarism within these, uh, within these broad um, organizations. So de facto the consequence is that we come to a situation where the pro-NATO stance just grows over time. Um, Okay, um, that is just a re very short recap of our um, stance of necessity, actually. And then I'll quickly, before I actually go to the specific, um, the specifics of how the debate developed within uh, us and our coalition or our working cooperation partners, um, a quick uh, recap of different forms how to, to, to draw lines, because I think you know, it's a, it's a very easy and quick slogan to say you've got to have clear demarcation lines between the things, but what does that mean in practice? Um, obviously, you've got the first possibility uh, of just splitting and, and organizationally saying, okay, we're not going to cooperate on uh, other things with you anymore because you have a bad stance. Um, there as well, we sort of say, obviously, that is a tactic what has been used in the past. I mean, if you, for instance, uh, just think of the the splits within uh, the social democratic movement around the First World War, where that was a, a very crucial element of that. Um, but we do say that is not a fetish, or it's not allowed to be a fetish, because, yeah, we just don't see the basis on that. And then <laughs> taking Mike, I don't know where he's sitting here. Um, yeah, we're basing it a bit on, on our reading of uh, Revolution Strategy, uh, page 85 and around. We say it's actually a clear tactical question um, do you do it or not? And for that, we would then argue that you sort of have to go into an analysis of how do you decide on the tactic, uh, looking at that, um, what I sort of here as, as passion, it's, it's got to look at the power structures, the agency within the in the left debate, and of course, the scale of the debate. So in this specific context um, of the Netherlands, um, we've got a uh, within the, the sort of system, a uh, situation where we are working together with other groups who actually have a more or less openly, but in our interpretation, a social imperialist um, stance within this um, within this context. Um, but as I brought up with the example from the left in Germany, the Lincoln, you have to then sort of look how are actually the power structures within these organizations um, of marginality and majority of um, how you can, yeah, how you can fight for 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 a political position. Within that context, of course, it's really important to look at the different actors. Um, in our situation, we've got the situation we've got it that the CP is actually the only broadly organized faction within the socialists. Uh, we have. A few other groups like uh, Grenzenlos, uh, the SAP, uh, Mandalist 
uh, group of social employers what function as a group of it in there but not actually uh, organized very well as a faction and of course we have lots of uh lots of, <laughs> we have diverse other uh people who are there more or less as single people uh with a very broad political uh setting of actually left-wing reformers with marxist vocabulary over to different uh, flavors of marxism um, looking at the scale of the debate, uh, I think there are two main aspects I would want to raise here straight away is, of course, within the context now of the country, uh, we de facto in the public debate have a hegemony of uh, bourgeois narrative of uh, human rights, of national self-determination and one-sided aggression. Um, from from Russia within this context, that's sort of the hegemonic um, argumentation. What you get, and of course, so within the inner left debate, you've got to sort of factor that in as well. That of course, yeah, of course, of course that the debate is not just an empty debate in the room, but is actually bound up into the fact that we are here fighting against uh, a very strong and different analysis what um, yeah, is spouted out by the bourgeois media every day. Um, yeah, then on the other side, next to the splitting, of course, we've got the whole argument uh, side of drawing lines. And yeah, I think you can kill me for that later, but um, I would sort of distinguish, sort of, we distinguish sort of three different ways. Obviously, you've got the inner organizational fight uh, for, for positionings and, um, and uh, political phraseology in 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 documents. Then, of course, you've always got the possibility of of polemic attacks on the the, the different actors um, and their stance. And actually, we would distinguish from that, even though of course they are intertwined, but often when you're doing them, with actually the the to, to try to uh, demask the argumentation and the argumentational structures the social imperialists are using. Um, to make this maybe a bit more tangible, I'm not quite sure how understandable that was what I meant there. Um, I'll just sort of do a quick recap for, I think lots of you know the situation, uh, what was going around the, the whole Ukrainian debate within the CP, but I'll just quickly recap that. Um, just to make, clear, make it clear, actually our positioning to the war in Ukraine and our analysis of the war in Ukraine hasn't changed within the last two years within the organization. Uh, there has been sort of marginal shifts on the tactics of how to, to address the problem. Um, yeah, it, so one of the shifts what started is uh, with a sort of a bit of a, we all call it polemic uh, from, from the UK uh, towards our cooperation uh, within the socialist and the, uh, especially SAP uh, Hensen laws. Um, what, even if they distance themselves officially from being pro-war, uh, our analysis is that it's it's actually not a, um, a believable distancing. Uh, because if you, for instance, look at the website, um, under the guise of, uh, of facilitating debate, they are importing and translating uh, lots of texts from other people, from other left groups. And all of these texts, even though there's a disclaimer that is not the official positioning of uh, Hansen laws, um, it is always a pro war uh, or pro uh, military support uh, stance. Um, this also <laughs> came up a bit on the founding Congress uh, of the Socialisten. Um, that was end of last year. Um, there was a bit of a debate there on. Um, do we include a uh, distinctive anti-NATO uh, decision in the founding document or not? Uh, what was actually a bit, I think, looking at it in retrospect, a bit of a, a fake debate, to be honest, because um, at least on the wording of an of a anti-NATO stance, actually there was no, no bigger actor who was really against that. Uh, and uh, if you look at the, the, the voting protocol, 
came through on a very um, big margin. Um, where I think there is actually more substance uh, to the debate, but that wasn't really debated on the Congress openly very nicely, um, is of course, what does that mean in practice? And what, what does that mean for our analysis? And what does that mean for everyday positioning within this conflict? Um, okay. So it started off with a little bit of a polemic uh, against that, where we got attacked of allegedly losing our our stance there. Um, I'm not going to recap the whole um, discussion process, but it sort of ended up in a, a joint um, declaration between actually our leadership, the city of Austria, with the uh, uh, PCC. Um, what we now see as not a very good way of approaching it within the specific Dutch context. Um, I mean, first of all, um, well, because of the, the, the wording, um, the, yeah, it was a very weird reaction within uh, the socialists, um, very much focusing on the, the tone debate and the tone deafness, well, I'd actually agree with a bit, um, and not on the actual uh, political substructure, what lots of the members uh, didn't find so nice, or not, not just nice, but uh, not uh, productive. In this and there was a very, uh, because of the relatively strong position of the CP within socialists, uh, there was lots of fear mongering around uh, us um, now cleansing the movement or whatever. Um, instead of actually focusing on the actual argumentation of what is the situation there and why do we have to take an anti narrative stance, especially in this conflict. Uh, this led then to a Nazi von Achtkirving. Um, it's sort of a, a motion what that's tabled. I, couldn't find a good translation for it. What sort of more expresses the um, that the membership is not happy with what happened. Um, it has absolutely no consequences of that people have to leave their post or anything like that. Um, it more or less sort of says what you did in the specific course, as in the whole board in that case, we do not find good. And uh, please do not repeat that. Um, I can delve into it a bit longer, the, the, the debates about that, but I think that's not really interesting. But, but if, if you want to, you can ask on that later. Um, but that, that was taken, that was uh, accepted from the Congress uh, with a, a super big majority, over 90%, I think, uh, with only single members uh, not, not voting for, and the board not voting for. Um, uh, the consequences of that is that, uh, or the, the, the resolution of that was that we republicized um, the declaration with exactly the same wording, <laughs> uh, but uh, with uh, introductionary um, text to it, because um, next to this whole tone debate, there were sort of like two main uh, points of criticism here. One was that, for instance, the historical debate or the historical examples of the First World War and a few other um, phraseologies within the thing were, were not contextualized, um, being though we actually had an internal, very clear line on how we stand to the, um, to the um, Ukraine crisis and the situation there and the, and the war. We hadn't actually publicized a lot on that beforehand. So within the interleft debate, we had the feeling that it was very easy for uh, social imperialists to then just argue it out of context. Uh, yeah, because we didn't actually, yeah, we weren't clear enough on the contextualization of what we were saying. So it just, um, yeah, made it easier for the, to be rebuffed. Um, yeah, so those two, these elements were, were were introduced, and it has as a consequent was not actually part of the well, it was part of the motion, but it wasn't part of the introductory text. Is that because of the practice of sort of saying, well, actually we should have a stronger focus on demasking the argumentation. Um, 
we have now started to, to publicize more to the public and trying to actually go into the, the different arguments um, of mainly Jensen Wars, but other actors as well. Um, yeah, uh, I'll just quickly here uh, quote, uh, just to, to, to make the point. Uh, Opportunisme war sozial imperialisme in Form von ist, Mut frustrieren worden, ma wei sein sauberig dazu nicht als wirksame Strategie. Im Platz davon streben wir danach, wir in Open Debatte für Mehrheit gewinnen und in unsere eigene opportunistische Tendenzen zu kehren. In unsere eigene uh, opportunistische Tendenzen zu kehren. So that means uh, opportun opportunism, uh, where social imperialism is a specific form of, um, has to be fought against, but we do not think that uh, cleansing the movement or cleansing the party uh, of the people is a, a workable strategy at this time here. Instead of that, we are trying to um, win the debate, win a majority within the debate, um, so as to clean at the movement in our eyes of opportunism that way. Um, yeah, I'm nearly finished already. Uh, that was really quick. <laughs> yeah, um, and just just to make sure, I want to sort of quickly go into um, the details or a few details of where we see different strategies of doing the debate or or or, or writing on the subject. First of all, um, I guess that can be contested, but we we thought. The way the debate was uh, uh, um, was started, uh, especially and with without uh, pre publicization of, of of clearly understandable positionings for the public, uh, it led to unnecessary alienation of different people, um, especially in the context that um, when you attack people as people. Uh, or, or move groups uh, for their policies, um, it is very important to be really specific on who you are actually meaning. Um, and I think a strategic uh, problem with the declaration we had was that so as to have one relatively short text to fit all, the phraseology is relatively open there. So of course you have a, a public declaration with vague formalities of who's actually addressed with what sentence, leading to a situation that, of course, uh, you give the power of interpretation to the other side, um, meaning that you have people you are actually meaning to address who then stand there and sort of like, okay, I'm not a social imperialist, so doesn't, they're not meaning me, uh, even though I, I want to uh, uh, I want to up the, the, the NATO um, budget or whatever. And on the other hand, you have other people who then, yeah, feel addressed uh, by, by underpoints um, of the declaration, what maybe really is not addressed to them. Um, and that, of course, gives the power within this interpretation also um, to the other actors of then just dismissing arguments um, to a certain extent. Um, yeah, so that was one of the consequences we are trying to address now differently. Um, a consequence we, we drew out of it um, is as well that, and we've actually been doing that from the start, but we've intensified that of saying it is important to actually raise the issue every time in every context. Uh, what does that mean? Well, first of all, it means that we've had sort of uh, sort of online and article debates with other actors uh, in the left, uh, also with partial um, with, with answers to their to their articles and their translations. But also that on every conference now, and we're really seen a bit as the uh, annoying children at that point uh, of time, um, the question of Ukraine is tabled from us in some form. Um, and we just, even though we have won the vote on the positioning, we say that is actually not enough because you can easily win a vote on something with a majority, but you actually have to, you know, you've got to win the argument and win the, 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 the thinking structure, what is behind that. And our analysis of the, the place of socialism at the moment is not just with Ukraine, we have 
lots of other uh, debating points there as well, but we haven't actually won the argument. We, we've won the majority, we, we've won the positioning, but we haven't won the argument yet. And I think that's going to take a while. Um, yeah, one thing I think what is also a bit maybe a bit different uh, in our uh, approach um, and was a bit contested within the CP is that we, of course, I, you know, on a side point, I will say that as Marxists, of course, um, we learn from history and we use historic examples as well to get to broader senses of understanding. The thing is, though, of course, that the specific contexts of different situations are different. Um, so um, we think that actually it's more productive within the debate, especially about sort of emotional questions like uh, um, the, the war in the Ukraine and wars generally can be, um, that you are very careful of contextualizing your examples, of showing the, the, the similarities, the similarities of structures, but also the differences of specific um, situations. And then the last thing is um, something much, of course, ongoing learning process as well, but um, that you've got to distinguish between the question of actually using counter arguments within a debate instead of um, just bringing up your own arguments. Um, and that's sort of a bit where, where the, the, the topic from demasking their argumentation versus just being right, right and, and, and winning the argument um, or formally winning the argument comes from. Um, as an example, I want to go back again to, to the left in Germany. Uh, the left in Germany has a relatively nice uh, um, history of factions and, and the allowance of, of factions within the party. The thing is, though, that more or less since the, the, the forming of the party, it's a very formalized debate between factions. Or I would actually go so far to say there's actually no debate anymore. Because, because of the formalization, it is every group and every side brings up their argument, but because it's just focused on I'm stating my own argument and not actually counter-arguing the arguments on the other side, it's not a debate, uh, and it's not an open-ended debate, and it, from my point of view, has sort of uh, brought the left in Germany to the situation um, yeah, that, that you have exactly the same factions as you did 15 years ago with exactly the same positionings. Though, I mean, that as such is not nice, it's not productive, but that wouldn't be so bad. The problem though is, if you look at the reality of mixed projects, um, I think you see that very strongly in Germany, but I think you see that with, with lots of historic uh, examples, you quite often have a distinction of, or sort of a, a, a split of labor between different groups and Especially the more reformist and more parliamentary focused group quite often go to the parliamentary work and dominate that. So if we now go back to the, the question of power structures, that actually means that over the long run, because of the, the resources there, you actually have a shift, not in the arguments between the different factions, but in the relative power of the factions to, to each other. And I think you can see that in lots of historic examples where these mid through this, this tendency mixed projects seem to sort of, not, not constantly, but from a tendency always go more and more to the right and more and more to, to reformism uh, over. Um, and the CP line on, on that aspect at the moment is that we try to counter that, and especially within the socialist, of, of having a very strong focus on, on different forms or different elements of our, our debate culture. And um, yeah and trying to facilitate that. And finishing with debate culture, uh, yeah, I want to open for 